Words uttered from one's last breaths create meaning that outlives the person speaking them. Many don't consider their final moments until they look death in the face, but Jesus did. Every word he spoke brings us new life, but none greater than in his final breaths. As he hung there on the cross, tortured, dying, struggling for air and barely able to breathe, Jesus didn't hang in silence. He spoke to those around him, strangers, family, friends. Today from the cross, Jesus is speaking to you and me. Good morning. What a powerful time of worship. We should just keep singing. You guys want to start with me? We'll go, thank you. No, I'm kidding. I'm Chad. Uh, I'm the missions pastor here at FBC, and, and I'm so privileged to get to, to be with you this morning and share from God's Word. Before I jump into it, I want to just give you a quick update on perspectives. There's been a few times uh, this spring where I was supposed to, and both times we kind of got away from it. Uh, you may remember that we were pushing this class that was going to be here in the spring, uh, in the fall, and uh, just praise God, we've had 62 students that are taking the class right now. And, uh, and over 30 of them are FBC members. So it, it is a big deal, and I'm just so thankful for all of you who are taking it. Um, the impact of the class continues to, to just be uh, major and overwhelming. I, I keep getting reports from the students saying that this is helping us see the scriptures in a whole new way. And, uh, and those of you who are taking it, you should tell your friends and, and families about it because uh, the class is having a substantial impact. I, I see some, now I'm seeing all the students here in the class, so in the, in the church. We're so thankful for, for you and pray that God would continue to use that class to impact um, our, our area. There are 11 churches represented in it. And so it's a pretty cool thing that has uh, an opportunity to bring about some commonality between the churches and Bernie as well. So be praying for us. Oh, over the last several weeks, we have been walking through Jesus' last words on the cross. And they're powerful words. They're impacting words. And we've watched um, how Jesus has, has given his executioners unconditional pardon. You remember that? Re remember when he, he, he looked to the, the thief on, the, on his side and he, he gave him an undeserved paradise. What, what powerful, powerful moments. And to his mother, last week we talked about how he gave her care and protection to, the, to, to his best friends to take care of her and provide for her. And this morning we're going to look at the next one. It's, it's a very short um, saying of Jesus and it starts in John 19, 28 through 30. Look at it with me. It says this. It says, later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. Let's pray. Father, as we consider your words, as we consider your son's words among his last, we pray, God, that you would open our hearts, that, God, you would speak to us, that, God, as we consider the living water asking for a drink, God, that our hearts will be touched. We love you. We pray that you'll be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. These verses are actually packed with enormous power and significance. On the surface, you might think that Jesus was just in a really bad place. And uh, that his body was, was dehydrated because of his traumatic injuries and the blood that he had lost. And, uh, and, and, and if you're thinking that, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Uh, th there's, there's lots and lots of, of research that will tell you when a body is in the condition that Jesus' body was in, one of the things that happens is an extreme dehydration. In fact, it's so overwhelming that some people are begging for water in, in moments like this. But the irony here, it's hard to miss, isn't it? That the creator of the world is approaching his own death. The one that gave life to the world itself is now at the end of his uh, the, the, the psalmist says that he's in the dust of death. And one of the things that is so clear in this is it reminds us that Jesus himself was fully human. Like, I really appreciate you, Chopper, for saying amen right there in that moment. Because this is a big deal. In our world today, I think it's so easy for us to, to focus on the fact that Jesus was God that we forget that he was fully man. 
There's so much about his power and, and the miracles that he did and the influence that he had and continues to have today that we forget that he was just like us in every way. Hebrews 2, 17, it says, for this reason, he had, been, he had, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. Think about that. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of his people. Today, I'm not sure that we really believe that Jesus was human. Again, we're so overwhelmed by all the things that he did and all the things he continues to do that we think of him in this deific um, godness and it makes it really difficult for us to think that he actually cares about us in a personal and real way. Uh, uh, we, we travel fairly often because of missions. I want to show you this picture of a church in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, this church is over a thousand years old. The, the people there is our partner, Gia. He spoke last week uh, in our Sunday school classes and uh, our growth groups. And then next to him is Josh Richardson. His family is right here. You'd be proud of that kid. He's a good guy. Um, Josh Richardson went with me in November, and we were in Tb Tbilisi, Georgia. And just outside of Tbilisi is this church, and it's in a town called Mishketa. Well, all over Georgia, there are these churches. They're ancient churches. They're, 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 they're places where Jesus is worshiped. And inside of there, there's icons. You know what an icon is? It's pictures of the saints. And, uh, and as they go into these churches, they buy these little candles and they put them in, these sand, in the sand so they stand up and the flames on the top. Have you, some of you have seen this kind of thing before? And, uh, and all around the church, there's these lit candles and they, they'll go up to the icon picture and they'll kiss the saint and they'll pray to the saint. And there's little, little prayers at the bottom telling them what to pray to this saint because each saint has like a, they're like specialists. You know, if you're a taxi driver, you go to the saint of taxi drivers and you pray that you would have protection, right? And you, you light your candle. And there's that kind of thing. Well, what's interesting is there's a Jesus icon and there's the Mary icon and there's the Father icon and there's all these others, hundreds of icons in each one of these churches. And there's candles all over except for in front of the icon of Jesus. And every time I go in the church, it shocks me. I, I, it's just one of these things. I just don't understand why... Do they feel so comfortable with all of the icons? Mary has the most candles, and there's no candles in front of Jesus. And I've thought about that a lot, and I've talked to a couple of different Georgian leaders, and I think it comes to this conversation that Jesus is too dangerous. He's too godlike. And so if you risk going to, to Jesus and you offend him, you've offended the God of the universe. That's a big problem. So rather than go to him, they'll go to those humans Mary, the mother of God, you wonder why there's so much veneration for her? The Catholics say they don't worship her, they venerate her. The, the Orthodox would say the same thing. So why is there so much veneration to Mary? Because she's tangible. She's someone that you could have touched in the day. She's human in every way. And so all these saints, they represent people, and it's just so interesting that Jesus is fully human. On the cross, and he's about to die, he's begging for something to drink. And it reminds us that he is not just God. Does he have the power to take himself off the cross? Does he have the power to do things entirely differently than the story we know? Of course he does. But what does he do? He suffers and he stays there. And he suffers just like you and I would suffer in the same situation. Have you ever been nailed to a cross? <laughs> have you ever been whipped to the point that you couldn't stand? In? Probably none of us have experienced the torture that Jesus tortured here. But if you've ever hurt yourself in any way, you might get a sense of the pain that he was enduring. It wasn't like he was superhuman and none of these things happened to him. None of these impacted him that he just decided, oh, I'm going to flip off the pain switch or the, the suffering switch. No, no. He was fully human. He suffered through this in every way. And there's some things that we should take away from that. One is that he knows you. He's close to you. He knows what it feels like when you're disappointed or hurt or frustrated or injured. He knows what it is to be human. And so don't avoid him. Don't be like those, 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 those stories I'm telling you about in the, in the churches in Georgia. Put your candles in front of him. Take your request straight to Jesus. He's the only mediator between God and man. He's close to us. He's like a friend, he tells us. And this Jesus is the good shepherd. He knows you. He loves you. If there's anything that we take away from this moment at the cross, is that he can identify with the suffering of all humanity. 
He is not distant and far and separated. He's close and he's human. And there's beauty in that. And I hope that we dig into it. I'm afraid so often that 2,000 years removed, we're so focused on the deity of Christ that we forget the humanity of Christ. And when we do that, we avoid some of the things that make him most approachable, most accessible, and most like us. The second thing it reminds us of is that this is this Jesus, he, is, he was the Messiah. This is it's like the opposite of the one I just told you. He's human and he's the Messiah. There's some things, when John writes um, that, that he's going to fulfill Scripture, so Scripture would be fulfilled, he's referencing a couple Old Testament passages. And, and what we're going to do this morning is we're going to read through a couple Psalms um, because you're gonna, I want you to, to think through words of David, King David, that were a thousand years before Jesus lived. And think about the descriptions he gives to what Jesus was going through that day on the cross. So, so think about this. In fact, I'm going to ask you here. We're going to read through Psalm 22. I'm going to ask you just like close your eyes. Imagine what it might have been like in Jesus in this moment. Think about his betrayal, his arrest, the beating that he endured, the torturous nailing to the cross. And here he is about to die. And a few verses later in John, he gives up his last breath. And what is he doing? How much is he hurting? What's it like? Well, look at this. This is what David writes in Psalm 22. So close your eyes and just listen to this. Listen to this description. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out to you day by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls around me, strong bulls of Bashan, encircle me. Roaring lions, they tear their prey, and they open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. The pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display, and people stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Can you hear Jesus speaking in these words? Can you hear the voice of someone who is being tortured on a cross? Can you hear the pain of, of joints being out of, of place and, and the pain of being tortured and hung and pierced? All those words written a thousand years before Jesus' crucifixion. And yet here you see such a clear portrayal. Think about the descriptions and how they match that crucifixion. We'll look at one more in Psalm 69. It says this, we're going to read a few verses again. It says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths. There is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters and the, the floods engulf me. I'm worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail. Excuse me. Looking for my God. And those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs on my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me, I am forced to restore what I did not steal. Lord, the God Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. For I endure scorn at your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner in my own country, a stranger to my own mother's children. Zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food. 
And this last line, they gave me vinegar for my thirst. If we took a long time, maybe in a several weeks, we could unpack both of these psalms. There's so much in here. You talk about the prophecy of the coming Messiah, the suffering servant, as Isaiah would call him later. But listen with your hearts and realize that Jesus' thirst, it ties him directly to these messianic prophecies written a thousand years before his death. One of the things that just stands out is that Jesus was very familiar with these verses. He knew them, which means he knew the path that he was about to walk. Could you imagine knowing what was coming and walking into it anyway? Could you imagine knowing that David had predicted in all of these details how much this was going to hurt? It gives you a different vision of what happened there in Gethsemane when he said, let this cup pass from me, Father. He knew clearly what was about to happen. And yet he did it anyway. And the question is, why? Why would anyone, I would dare to say none of us, would want that kind of thing or pursue that kind of decision? We might even tell him you're foolish. But why? Why does he have to hurt so much? And you know, the God that is is near to us in this moment is the time that he was distant from Jesus. And all of the pleas of Jesus to come and be, this is the moment where God had to step aside and Jesus had to suffer a criminal's death. When you read the words, I am thirsty, let it stand out to you. It's a, it's, a, it's a moment where Jesus is saying that he is doing all that is needed for the salvation of all mankind. Amen, Amen indeed. The humanity of Christ is, is so, dis, it's on display in a very evident and clear way. And the godness of Christ is on display. That Jesus had been, that was fulfilling prophecy is unbelievable that John wants to tie this together. The last thing that, that really stands out to me is that Jesus had, had given his life to satiate the thirst of those around him. Right, the thirst of the heart. He had talked about being the bread of life and he was the true vine, but he also said he was the living water. It was no accident that Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never thirst. And yet here he is on the cross saying, I'm thirsty. If you go to be with the story in John chapter four, it's the story of the Samaritan woman and we'll start in verse seven. It says, and when the Samaritan woman had come to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Jesus' disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman asked him, are you a Jew? You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? John tells us that the Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus asked her, answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have give, given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is an incredible story. And we know that God doesn't, Jesus doesn't just change her life. He changes the entire village's life, right? Right? This living water wasn't just enough for one thirsty soul. (laughs) The living water was enough for a whole village of thirsty souls. And it didn't stop there, did it? No, maybe your thirsty soul is here because Jesus had enough living water for you as well. Amen. Amen should be growing now. Like we're, we're getting to the good parts. Like this Jesus, the one that stood on the, that was nailed to the cross and said, I am thirsty, he is giving water to the entire planet, those who would choose him. Everyone who is thirsty, he is enough, he is sufficient, he can satiate your thirst. So my question for you today is, what are you thirsty for? What are you longing for? I would tell you that all desire All longing, all of it is based on the foundational need that all people have. 
Every desire echoes this desire, the thirst for the living God. Every desire draws us to that core desire to know the one that made us, to know the purpose for which we were made, to know the one that gave you all that you have, your talents and gifts and resources, the things that you chose and the things that you couldn't choose, who your parents were, what kind of home you were born into, the circumstances of your early childhood. You can't choose those things, but he gave them to you. He's the one who's made you, and every human heart wants to know their creator. And we look for it in any way possible. If you don't know Jesus, you look for salvation in anything you can. Maybe it's success, or maybe it's in pleasure, maybe it's in relationships, maybe it's just in money, maybe it's in any and every other way. So what is your heart hungry for today? What are you thirsty for? What are you longing for? The message of Christ, the message of the cross, is that this Jesus who died for us, who died for all of us, has drawn near to us. He's close. He knows you. It's Emmanuel, God with us. He's he's next to you today. He's always ever present. And the God that did all of this the one that suffered so much, the one that is here and ready and close. He loves you. He loves you and he's paid a price for you. Throughout history, God has called his people not just to accept the living water, but to tell others about that living water. You don't just become those who can receive it, that wellspring flowing for eternal life. It's a wellspring that flows out of you into others. And so I want to give you a couple opportunities this morning. Every time I touch this, it turns off. So I, it's fun. It's good times. <laughs> You're like, why does it keep stopping? It's because it goes blank. And then I go, I don't know. Paper, Jason, paper. Um, it never goes blank. I believe that there are some of you today whose heart is dry and cracked. And you know what it means to be thirsty. And if that's you, it's like your, your tongue is stuck to the roof of your mouth, like the psalmist says. If there's something inside of you just saying, I am thirsty, I need something. And today is a really good day. Because we have an answer. We, we can help you know who the living water is. And he's, he can be your friend. He can be close to you and near to you and speak to your heart and give you comfort in your sufferings and, and, and be your friend in the good times as well. He, is, he can be everything. Last night, I, I got to go to a, um, a fundraiser, the vision dinner for Hill Country Daily Bread. And there was a young man that stood up and talked about his testimony. He had met a mentor uh, through the ministry. He's a 15-year-old at Champion High School. And he started telling this story about how he was introduced to Jesus and how he'd never known Jesus before and how over the last few years he got to build a relationship with him and how it's become everything to him. And I love that picture because our hearts are thirsty and we find Jesus, he becomes that, that, that satiation, right? He becomes the fulfillment of our deepest needs, And so today, if you've never asked Jesus to be king of your life, if you've never asked him to fill your thirsty soul with his living water, today is the day. Today's the day. It's really simple. In fact, we're going to just take a moment here. We're going to to do this the old school way. Everybody, why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. If there's someone in here today who just says, I need something. My heart is thirsty then would you put your hand up? Would you put your hand up so we can pray for you and celebrate with you? I love that. Thank you. I see that hand. Are there others? I see that one as well. Thank you. Listen, guys, this water is enough to fill a thirsty and dry soul. So don't be afraid. 
If you raise your hand, would you please come and see us when this service ends? Come down to the front and talk to me. I'd love to hear what's going on in your heart. There's a card in the pew in front of you too. Fill it out so we can connect with you. If you raise your hand, say these words with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life and change my heart. Today, Lord, be my king. Father, I'm a sinner and I want to draw near to you. Forgive me for the things I've done wrong and become the living water in my life. Amen. I'm so excited for those of you that raised your hand. This is an, an, an incredible moment. But beyond that church, there's a moment for you as well. If you've been a believer, if you've known this living water for these years or these many years, then guys, it only gets better from here. Because the living water that has filled you is not just for you. It's so that those people around you can be filled with that same water. Jason mentioned that we're launching our witness campaign today. We're one month, four Sundays from, day is, from today is Easter Sunday. That's a big day. Here we are, 2024. In 2033, you know, we're gonna be celebrating the 2000 year anniversary of Easter. We're nine years away from that, but here, 2024, we've got it in four weeks. We're asking you to start praying for the people that are close to you and far from God. The people that you see day in and day out that you know who are parched, they're looking for answers that they don't have, answers that you have. So we're asking you, it's 331, March 31st, 331, pray for three people. Share with those three people between now and Easter and invite one family, maybe the, one of those families, into your home for a meal between now and then. It's incarnational ministry where you get to stand in front of somebody representing Jesus. You become the flesh. You become the one that they can touch and feel and see. But you're a minister, an ambassador of Christ. So when we, when we end our service today, we're going to invite you to go outside, and we have the witness boxes. We handed them out last year, but it's a box. And in the box are a bunch of resources for you. They're little tools that might help you have a really good connection with this family when you invite them to your house. There's some candy in there. There's a little squeeze ball that's a world. You can toss it and pray for different parts of the world if you like. There's instructions on, on conversation starters that could ask anything from how, how did you grow up or are you from here all the way to have you encountered a relationship with Jesus in the past or have you ever been to church in the past? These, they start spiritual type conversations. We have a training if you, on there, there's a link and you can go to it and see a tool called Prayer Care Share on how to invite a conversation with Jesus by asking people the first way, how can I pray for you? Most people in our culture are totally okay with that kind of question. So ask them. You ask them, how can I pray for you? And then you pray for them. That's the way you care for them. And then if God gives you opportunity, you have the opportunity to share the hope of, God, of Christ with them, share the gospel with them. If you don't know how, we've got like three different resources online on gospel tools that you can learn and train people on. How to, The three circles or the bridge illustration or, or Jason's black and white um, gospel presentation. There's great tools available to you. So I want to tell you, you don't have an excuse If those aren't enough, come and ask me and I'll help you. I'll, I'll, I'll coach you. I'll train you any way that I can. Inside those boxes is a letter from Jason and a gift card for $25, which we want you to use in that meal. We want you to use that when you invite someone to your house because we want to be a part of it. Last year, we handed out the boxes. A lot of people didn't want the, the gift card. It's like it made them nervous. If I take this gift card, they're going to ask me questions. We are going to ask you questions. We want to know how it goes. But it's not because we want to make you feel bad in any way. People are like, well, I don't need the gift card. I can just do it myself. That's fine. But if you, if you take the box, give the gift card to someone who you know needs it. Ideally, someone who's far from Jesus and may use this as a way to see God caring for them. Guys, you bless us with your generosity every single week. And so this is an opportunity for us to reinvest that in you and pray that God will bring a harvest from it. We're so thankful for what God is doing in this church and we're so thankful for you.
But we want to encourage that wellspring of life that, will, that comes up inside of us for eternal life. We want to encourage you guys to be those ambassadors and let that spring overflow your heart into the world around you. Here in a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to sing a song. And, and as we do those things, I want you to respond. Respond to what the Lord's saying to you. Think about who are the three that you're going to pray for and share with. Who's the family that you're going to invite into your home? Let your home become the extension of our church. Invite them into your home. Who are they going to be? And if you ask the Lord to be king of your life today, come down and talk to us. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you. Lastly, as we pray, we're also going to pray for our mission team. We have a team leaving next Saturday, March 9th, going to Yucatan. 18, it's our family trips. We've got three or four families going. It's going to be a really exciting time. We'll be down there until the 16th. So we're just going to pray that God would, would bless them and go with us as we go. And pray that God would give them the same thing, the opportunity to share the love of Christ where they are next week. So would you guys pray with us? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for just the way that you've moved throughout history. God, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you that he had the courage to walk through maybe the worst things that humanity can give. We thank you that he is the living water for us today. And that God, through his provision, we can be ambassadors around us. I pray for every single member in this church, every person that's here today, Father, that you would use us for your kingdom as your ambassadors. God, we pray for our team leaving next Saturday, March 9th, that you would go before them, all the details, the travel, God, the kids that are going, that God, you would speak to their hearts, God, and that this would be a moment where they can see you moving clearly in their lives. We pray that the impact beyond us the impact to the people that we're ministering to and ministering with would be just fantastic, God. That the kids at Kunamaya, the pastors there with Vita Life, that Father, they'd be encouraged, that God, they would be ministered to, and that Father, you would call some of them to be your children. Lord, it's for your glory that we sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please respond in any way that you see fit.